Yeah, thank you very much, Olivier and Denis, for organizing this and for giving me the opportunity to present uh, my lab's work. Um, I especially liked in, uh, the invitation because it came with a mission or it came with a, came with a, a theme um, which made me think um, what could my lab possibly have to contribute to the times of the embryonic development because we never really actively worked on this. Um, but of course, uh, there's a lot of dynamics in what we do and what we write about and so th somehow there should be a link. And um, I thought about it and I decided... Um, I'm still going to talk about transcription, but uh, I'll give you a, at least an intro slide on how we position transcription into uh, the uh, times of the embryonic development. And so if we typically think about times of embryonic development, I think they have to do with cellular processes, um, cell division, cell, the time it takes for a cell to differentiate, the time it takes for a cell to form a tissue or an entire organism, and that would then mean the times of you know, birth to death or conception to birth. Um, there's the segmentation clock. All of these are time scales which we, I think, happily and frequently would um, administer to uh, having something to do with the timings of development. And Denis phrased it nicely, how does the embryo figure out its pace? And I think... Um, these are long time scales, but the pace eventually still must be dictated by much smaller time scales that have to do with biochemistry and eventually transcription, because of course there are transcription networks that essentially form the cocktail of transcription factors that differentiate a cell, so that takes some time. And of course even a single gene in that network needs to be transcribed and that the biochemistry or the diffusion the kinetic uh, rates, the, uh, the contacts between the enhancer and promoter, all of these have timescales attached to each other that somehow must have an impact also on the pace of development. And so I don't have the question, the, the answer today of how they're actually linked, but maybe we can do this in the Q&A together. But I think that's, I, I guess, how I want to position myself in that larger question. Now, um, Let's jump into it. So basically, here, what we need to be able to do then is to bridge these different timescales all the way from um, the biochemistry up here to forming an entire organism. Of course, there's a, a huge differential from milliseconds going all the way to days or even a year. And I would like to position myself then here in this transcription realm and see what kind of timescales um, are set by those processes that eventually will lead to cellular differentiation, which eventually will, will then lead to tissue formation. And so um, my lab has been looking at transcription for a while. Why is this no longer working here? Um, and so we th the way we think about transcription is that the, uh, the information um, for a cell to differentiate is residing initially in a cocktail of transcription factors that bind to an enhancer. That information has to be integrated by the enhancer and then transported from the enhancer somehow through the 3D space in the nucleus often to the promoter. And then at the promoter, it's transferred into a transcription readout, into the, 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 the rate of mRNA production, if you want. And today I would like to look at two different aspects of this. One has to do with how is the enhancer talking to the promoter, what time scales are involved in, that, in these processes, and the other is how is the information converted in, at, at the level of the promoter into a, a productive mRNA um, output. And so let's, let's start with the latter first. What's happening here, of course, is <clears throat> you, you might have heard about transcriptional bursting. There's a lot of noise involved in the making of a gene. These are molecular processes often single molecular processes, so the promoter can be on in an on and an off state, so there's, a, there's this very famous um, uh, model of uh, the two-state model or telegraph model, where you basically have a promoter that can be uh, silent, or you can have a promoter that's, uh, that's uh, act in, in an active state, uh, happy for production, for the binding of polymerases to then elongate and produce nascent mRNA, and this generates bursts. And these bursts look like in a cartoon, here you have transcriptional activity, as a function of time, and you have these intermittent uh, uh, alternating uh, periods of on and off where the promoter can accept or not uh, polymerases, and when it can polymerases, you can get these, these bursts, these green uh, um, times of activity, if you want. And so, as I said, this is extremely noisy, 
Um, and one of our goals was to maybe try to understand some of this noise at the level of the promoter with very high detail, mathematically if you want, and then use this by looking at the, not just the mean but also the variances and use these the mathematics of uh, the, the mRNA production to maybe understand something that's happening in the upstream events. Can we see signatures in the variances, in the noise of, the, of promoter activity about how enhancers and promoters talk to each other? Can we see signatures in the variances of the promoter output of how transcription factors bind on and off on enhancers, of how multiple enhancers act together, of cis regulatory elements, whatever, you name it, that, that, that was the goal, okay? And so the first thing we need to do then is to make a very good measurement to not just be able to measure the mean, but also the variances and maybe even higher moments. The more you can measure, the deeper you can go in the system, the more you have a sensor, that was at least our hope, of what is happening upstream. And so the first thing to do is then to turn this cartoon into reality. Um, and we do this with imaging. It took us um, almost 10 years to get to a level where we have single molecule resolution in these macroscopic movies. So here you see the surface of a fly embryo. In red you see, um, you see nuclei and in, 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 in bright you see active sites of transcription. They're very bright because there's many polymerizers at once working away on these active sites. Um, here you see a zoom in, you see individual M mRNA molecules that are diffusing away from this locus and you see the locus is extremely bright and what you can do in the system is now A, quantify the numbers of mRNA or the, 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 the dynamics of the mRNAs as, as their shadow from the locus and the other thing that you can quantify is you can look at this bright locus and look at its fluctuations because those fluctuations tell you something about the underlying dynamics of polymerases docking on and falling off. Okay? And so we have both of these at the level of the output at the single molecule level and at the level of polymerases, we know individual molecules uh, of polymerases that dock and that fall off. And so at both ends, we are basically as good as it gets in terms of uh, your noise properties. We handle the system such that we can count. And once you can count, you are in a very strong position to be able to do, to, to do something uh, deeper, or even mathematical with your system. And of course, everything happens in the fly embryo <clears throat> and you get a lot of statistics for free uh, because you have hundreds of, of uh, alleles that you can measure uh, at once and you can average over them and you get statistics and you can do uh, eventually math. And so this is how six of these alleles look. Um, here you have your activity as a function of time. You see there's very um, pronounced bursts um, of these six alleles. One allele is actually silent in red here. This gives you roughly the noise background. It's, it's, it's almost none. Um, these are in two different cell cycles, cell cycle 13 and 14 of this gene called hunchback. Um, the activity here is in absolute units, which is important if you eventually want to do math on your system. And this being the fly embryo, you can now use hundreds of these alleles from multi multiple aligned embryos in space and time. Um, you can take, once you have aligned them in space and time, you can take individual bins in space and then average over hundreds of nucleus, nuclei or alleles in a given, in a given um, spatial bin. Here you see for two of them, one more in the center of the embryo and more, one more at the anterior pole. So here this is the AP axis as it runs from the bottom to the top. And now what you can do is you can go in and say, well, in this five minute window here, remember everything is very bursty, you see it's extremely noisy, these traces, but in this five minute window here you can ask, well, let me average over all of my data that I have in this five minute window and then do this for every spatial location marching along the anterior posterior axis and see if I can reconstruct the full macroscopic pattern. And obviously you can, so here for this gene hunchback, the one that you see here, the burst, you see in, in blue, um, but you also get this for all other gap genes and you recapitulate very, recapitulate very nicely the macroscopic pattern that you see also <laughs> under your microscope. Okay? And so just uh, pause for a second, this means we are using these very noisy bursts from up here in time and transform them into a macroscopic pattern. And so there's a very nice example of how development is able to average in space and time to get something very uh, precise and reproducible in the end. We have done something similar with a very different technology called single molecule fish uh, a few years back. And you see uh, the data in, in black basically and you see how these two different approaches mimic each, each other perfectly. Um, the SM fish approach allows us to count numbers of mRNA molecules and we can from that transform 
our units both in the FM fish but also at the hotspots at the level of uh, live hotspots using this uh, uh, this um, uh, this fit between the f between the the, uh, the live and the fixed data um, to turn our units into absolute equivalent cytoplasmic units of polymerases or mRNAs that are actively working away on your on your locus. All right. So now. What we wanted to do, of course, is to characterize the dynamics and the noise of these bursts. And so there's a bunch of parameters that are attached to this. You might have heard of um, uh, sizes of bursts, of frequencies of bursts, of uh, time periods during which the bursts uh, are on or off. Um, and so these we'll, we would like to extract now and then understand something about how um, transcription dynamics emer emerges from these bursting dynamics, and here again you see a single uh, allele, how it bursts, and you see plotted on top of it individual polymerized loading events that give rise to this particular allele. Okay? And because we have a little bit of measurement noise, of course, in the system, there's not just one train of polymerases that can give rise to this particular um, uh, activity trace, but there's many of such trains, in fact there's thousands, and if you generate thousands of those trains, all um, uh, in sync with the data that we get, well, you can average over them and construct a single allele transcription rate, which you see here in blue. Oh, sorry, which you see in black. Okay, and so you can now, and so this means we have now here units of polymerases per minute that hop onto the locus, and so now you can use this and determine um, where um, do we have our bursts, and um, essentially by hand you can go in and say wherever your rate is larger than one polymerase per minute, you call it an on uh, period, and wherever it's lower, it's an off period. And so you see here now the reconstruction of the cartoon into reality where we have you know, called essentially our, our bursts. And you can do this, of course, this here is for a single allele, you can do this for many alleles. Here we're doing it for 200. For 200, you have, here you have the rate in, in black, and here you have the, the, uh, the alternating on and off periods in blue. These are two data matrices that you can now use to extract your bursting parameters. Remember, this is all at one spatial location, at one particular developmental stage, nuclear, cell, nuclear cycle 14, for one particular gene called hunchback. And so the first um, par bursting parameter we can extract is now the average transcription rate at that particular location in the embryo for that particular gene. Is, and this is you get by just you know, averaging over the y-axis of these individual uh, low, uh, allele uh, rates and your average rate looks like this as a function of time. Just take it for what it is. You can do the same by averaging here. What you get is the probability of a given allele to be on. Okay, so if you look at your allele and at any moment in time, what is its probability to be able to accept polymerases? We call this P on. And now if you condition the rate only on the on region, if you now measure the rate only during the on regions, you can extract um, your initiation rate K. These three are, of course, linked. The, uh, the, the, the average bursting rate is given by the product of the initiation rate times this P on, and this, of course, works. I spare you the plot for this. At the same time, we can also extract, of course, the average um, windows the bursts are on, the average windows the, the locus is quiescent. These, are, these we call T on and T off. And there's a last bursting parameter that we like to use, which is the so-called switching correlation time, which is the inverse of the sum of the on plus the off rate. Okay, so it gives you this switching correlation time as a time scale that essentially tells you once a locus is on, how long does it have the propensity to stay on? And how long, when it, when it is off, how long does it have the propensity to stay off? So it tells you something of the, the locus basically flopping back and forth between an on and an off state. All right, so this was for, for a single spatial location, but we can do this, of course, marching along the entire IP axis, which is here encoded in, in color. And you see that for these six bursting parameters, the data looks like all over the place. Okay? This is certainly not in a stationary regime. It's highly non-stationary, so steady state here is a little bit questionable. These are very active and dynamic uh, control parameters. But now, time turns out to be not a very good parameter to look at when you look at these, uh, at, uh, how these different uh, parameters change. Um, it turns out that it's much better to parameterize your system by this on probability. So you view it as a knob, your locus is to 
turned completely off to completely on. And now you can go in and say, well, let's say at 20 minutes, I have a certain rate at a certain position. What was my P on? So I have now a couple of R and P on, and I can plot the R as a function of P on. I can do the same for the initiation rate. And if I do this, you see that suddenly all of the data collapses. You have two very tight relationships, one for the average rate as a function of this P on. It, we have the luxury with this gene hunchback that we have instances where the gene was totally turned off which is here at zero, and it was totally fully turned on, which is here at one, so we scan the entire possible dynamic range for this gene. It is quite big, goes up to way, all the way to 15 polymerases per minute. Um, and similarly, for this initiation rate, the dynamic, the dynamic range is much smaller, it's a factor of three only. In fact, a, a large proportion of this factor of three comes from the fact that we don't separate sister chromatids. If we could, this would be almost flat. Now we can do the same for the on and off periods, and you see that these also collapse into two very tight asymmetric relationships. And most surprisingly, in fact, there's this switching correlation time, which seems to be flat constant. Okay, so this gives us a first time scale, if you want, in the system, where the switching correlation time, the time with which the promoter is flopping back and forth, is of the order of one to two minutes. Now, this does not only happen for nuclear cycle 14, but here we plot the data from nuclear cycle 13 on top of the nuclear cycle 14 data, and you see it collapses as well. It turns out it doesn't only work for the gene hunchback, but it works for all of the gap genes. So here they, you see these five relationships are conserved across all genes. Um, we can now plot them all together. If you want. Well, first of all, what it means is that there's some very strong regularity underlying transcription is apparently in the system. There's a, si a single control knob that seems to uh, govern um, all of these rates. Um, and there's surprisingly two qu quantities that seem to be constant across genes, time, and space. And so if you plot all of the data together, these are hundreds of thousands of data points. In a density plot, you see in green here very tight relationships that we um, uncover. Um, it turns out that if you take this two-state model that I talked to you before, um, re remind you, none of this is using any modeling. All of this is just empirical data collection, massaging the data a little bit and plotting it in the right way, and you get uh, these relationships. There's no model, no you know, active modeling underneath. The only model we have is one we use in order to extract individual polymerate loading events by using an inference approach, but they are very small, some assumptions, we can talk about them, but this is the only really modeling aspect that goes in. But now if you can take this two-state model and ask what would the two-state model produce, well, it comes in relationships where you essentially can, extra, uh, can re report all of these parameters as a function of peon, and it turns out if you plot them on top of our data, they fit, they fall right into the green areas with zero parameters fits, okay? So this is a, this is a very strong uh, uh, suggestion that this, um, this model, at least for these genes, seems to be working quite well. We were so surprised by this that we decided, well, let's perturb the system and let's um, uh, uh, knock out an enhancer, for example, let's do a cis perturbation. And you see by knocking out an enhancer of this gene hunchback here, um, it changes the pattern dramatically from wild types, meaning we acted on this peon quite severely. However, even though Pion changed, the bursting parameters all collapsed again on our wild type data. Something similar happens for transmutation when you take out an entire transcription factor and look at a, a gene that this controls. Again, the pattern shifts quite wildly, meaning we acted on Pion. However, our bursting parameters all collapse on, of, on our wild type data. Well, then we became more ambitious and looked in the literature. There's other labs that um, uh, extracted similar bursting parameters uh, in different systems. Here are two papers that did this in the fly. Um, and lo and behold, their data also collapses on our relationships. Um, and last but not least, we went into different organisms in yeast and mammalian systems. And there are two papers um, that we so far looked at their data also collapses on our relationship. So there's something extremely regular underlying transcription that seems to hold across space, time, different genes, perturbations, and apparently also different species. And one of those things that came out is that there's this conserved switching correlation time, which is of the order of one to two minutes, 
a conserved initiation rate, which is of the order of three to five minutes. And so those are time scales that apparently are invariant across all of these different conditions. Okay? And so those, in a way, must set also the stage for the possibility of the cellular differentiation eventually. All right, and so what we learned essentially is that um, um, we cleaned up a little bit our way of thinking about this bursting. There's a single parameter that seems to control all of the different bursting parameters, including burst size and burst frequency, which are just a different way of looking at the on and off, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the times uh, a burst is on or a time a burst is off. This works because there's two conserved quantities, the switching correlation time and the initiation rate. And presumably, um, all of the things that um, could affect transcription, or that will, that do affect transcription, that we know affect transcription, they don't individually affect either the burst, the size, or the frequency, or the length, or whatnot. They affect P on, and then once you have P on, all of these other parameters are essentially determ deterministic. Okay? And so our dream, well, let's measure these things very minutely and be able to tell something about the upstream events and learn something about transcription. That failed, but at the same time, we discovered some very strong regularities that underlie transcription, which will help us, of course, in the future to, um, to understand the molecular mechanisms that you know, implement this at the level of this p on, and hopefully then also at the level of how these um, upstream factors affect p on. All right, um, one last word on this, on this switching correlation time. What does it mean for development? Well, the fact that, is, that it is small is actually a good thing because it means that noise filtering, you know, transcription is, is, is noisy. We have seen this, bursts are very noisy. But you want this to be small because you want to filter noise. If this would be in, at our level, we would never be able to differentiate a cell in our time. And so the fact that this is almost an order of magnitude different helps you to become precise and reproducible, as we know, and cherish our developmental systems to be. This is one thing. And the other thing is, if there is an, if there is a, um, a, an acute change uh, of the system, an external acute change, and the system has to react, transcription being a fast or a minute timescale process helps for this kind of reactivity and for switching your transcription program from one end to the, to the, to the next. All right, um, do we still have time, Denis? So um, this was um, at the level of the promoter. Let me just in the last uh, five minutes or so give you just a hint on how we try to approach similarly the time scale that happens between an enhancer talking to a promoter. This, you might think it's a very different time scale. It could be the same. We don't know what it is. So let's go in, design again an imaging protocol that will hopefully allow us to see these loops here in action. Um, so we did this a few years back um, where we labeled enhancers. This is again a live, live imaging approach. We labeled enhancers here in blue. And we label a promo an ectopic promoter in green. Um, when the ectopic promoter and the enhancer come in close contact, there's a third color coming on, which is, which is red. So there's a three color uh, labeling approach. Here you see a, a close up, uh, the dance between the enhancer and the promoter. Um, and when they come close, there's a red color firing off. You can compute the Euclidean distance between the enhancer and the promoter. You see here in blue, it's pretty noisy, but when it crosses a certain threshold, transcription starts to jam up. Okay, so that's the system. And so what we have done lately, recently with this system is to um, take this ectopic promoter and shift it, slide it up and down the second cr uh, chromosome of the fly genome and see its scaling properties with respect to the enhancer. So the, the distance, now the nominal distance, genomic distance of these enhancer and promoter pair is now different. What, how does that affect um, the, uh, the, 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 the dance between them and them, the propensity of them to find each other and to uh, um, result in productive transcription. And so, first, if you just look at the distribution of Euclidean distances um, for, uh, for your, for your um, different uh, setups here, you see that for the very far ones, of course, the distribution function is extremely broad and the mean is far out. But if you go closer and closer, this mean comes closer and closer to the one that you would have in a transcriptionally active state. Okay? So nothing new. This is 
this is probably something that everybody would have expected. So how does it influence transcription? So let's look at just two states here. This, let's approximate the system by two states. There's a transcriptionally off and a transcriptionally on state. And you can ask, once you're in the transcriptionally on state, what is the lifetime that you stay in the transcriptionally on state? And how does that depend on the distance between the enhancer and the promoter, the nominal distance? And the answer is, well, it does not depend on that distance. Once you're active, once you're in a confined state, it doesn't really matter how much DNA you have dangling in a loop behind you. You'll just be active, and that's it. And it turns out, so it means this is flat, and it turns out that the lifetime, at least for this system, is of the order of 10 minutes. Okay? So this, once you're <clears throat> once you are in this transcriptionally active state, that's what, you, that's what you get. And then within these 10 minutes, of course, given the one and a half minute switching correlation time from the previous uh, half of the paper. That means that you have several times that the promoter can flop back and forth. You have several births that could come in. Okay, And so none, nothing uh, too surprising here. Now, what is the probability, probability though, of going into, of being in this transcriptionally on state? Well, that probability, of course, does depend with genomic distance. And in fact, it falls off, as it should. Larger distances should have much lower probability for the enhancer and the promoter to be able to find each other. Um, now that we know so that transcription does depend on this distance, that means we should be interested in the dynamics of the enhancer and the promoter of finding each other. And so we should be interested in the two locus dynamics of, uh, of the system. And so here we're having the red and the blue being connected by a chain that can be that can be approximated by something called a Rouse model, where we just have a diffusive walk of these two different guys that are kind of linked to a chain. And you can ask, what is the average distance that these guys are apart from each other when you start them together at one point and, in, and then you wait in time? So they start to explore space, right? So you have them initially at time zero, you have them on top of each other. My arms, if you want, are the other are the DNA that links them. So initially, they're just moving around. They don't feel each other. They're just as if they're independent. But if they are starting to walk longer and longer, they start to explore regions where the chain is almost stretched. And when the chain is stretched, of course, they should feel each other. They can't go further than that. And so this is why the model essentially rolls off here asymptotically. And that's the most simple model, polymer physics model, that can describe two random walkers on a, that are linked by a chain. Okay, and it turns out that our data falls right on that, on that model. This is, this, is, this is for one specific genomic distance. Um, and it turns, off, it turns out there is something like this, um, like a, a specific time scale, again, attached to this, which is where you essentially have to have, to have this crossover, where these two guys will start to sense each other. Okay, and that time scale, if you want, is important if you want to understand how enhancers and promoters find each other, because it's at that time scale that they start to sense each other and start to say, hey, I, I, I might want to go towards the promoter. So, okay, that just gives you a characterization, a physical characterization of your, of your walk. And, um, in the, and this is called a relaxation time. Again, it's also at the level of 10 minutes, curiously. Um, you know, it's 10 minutes like similar to the lifetime, but 10 minutes for the large distance that we look at or the large, the, the, the large scaling of time intervals, of timings that we have looked at on my, on my first slide, 10 minutes and 2 minutes is roughly the same time scale, which is in and of itself interesting. So the transcription time scale of the promoter flopping back and forth and the time scale of these guys sensing each other is of similar order. And remember, this is at quite a far distance. If you're going now to smaller distances, this relaxation time becomes shorter and shorter. Okay? And so... What was curious, though, is that this relaxation time, if you plot the relaxation time as a function of the nominal genomic distance, it scales much, much weaker than any of the current out there polymer physics models would predict. Okay? And that has strong consequences for transcription, of course, because what it's so, first of all, let's put ourselves back into the, um, the, 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 this two state where we have transcription on and off, and now let's focus on this time you stay in the off state, which, if you think about it, is really the encounter time. Okay, at what time do you start, you know, binding to the promoter? And so it turns out that this encounter time and this relaxation time they are correlated, 
which means that this relaxation time has a functional consequence, which means it dictates the encounter time. Okay? And the fact that it is much weaker than what typical, um, what typical polymer physics models would tell you means that, so if, here, if you have here the relaxation time again, and here we have, um, we have the distance in, gen in gen genomic distance, these are, this is the Rouse model here. If you just, let's just start with the Rouse model. Um, it turns out that this very large distance point here at 3.3 megabase, the Rouse model would predict that it takes 3,000 times longer for the enhancer and the promoter to find each other than our closest separation that we have. However, what we see is that it only takes roughly 20 times longer, which means that there's an over 100-fold reduction in encounter times that these guys find each other, which means that this is something, you know, that might be the reason why distant enhancer promoter, distant DNA elements are at all able to find each other. And this is something that evolution might be able to work on in order to make distant cis regulatory elements work on a promoter that's far away. All right, so I guess this is where I want to stop. Um, again, to recapitulate, I showed you transcription has timescales attached to them, to it. These are timescales that are seemingly invariant, which means that you know, anybody, which, uh, any eukaryotic system should care about this. Developmental systems should care about this, and they set, in a way, the pace of how developmental systems can express genes and can differentiate cells. Even if the timescales are far away, I gave you an idea of why it's good that they're far away from the, really the differenti differentiation timescale, because you need to filter noise, you need to be able to, re you need to be reactive, and we saw, saw in the second half that there is a, um, a relaxation time scale attached to the finding of for two promoters and enhancers finding each other, which is much weaker dependent on distance than what you would than what typical models or polymer physics models that describe very well typically the dynamics of these polymers uh, of the DNA polymer, but somehow this encounter time they cannot describe, which means that there's some new biology that we need to find, and um, this is not me. You should all do this. Um, I would like to thank the people in the f uh, that did this work. The first half was um, spearheaded by um, a PhD student in the lab, Pota Chen, who um, really worked tirelessly for several years on, on the microscopy to get this down to a level of single mRNA output, single, single polymerase input. Michal Levo, who um, developed all the... Um, the, uh, the, uh, the CRISPR tools that we need, the fly lines, and Ben, who was responsible for the entire image analysis. Um, in the second half of the talk, um, was spearheaded by Hong Tao Chen, the postdoc in the lab, who is now at Shanghai Tech, um, Leo Baranov, who is now an MD at UPenn, and uh, David Bruckner, a theorist who did all the analysis and who is ISD Austria. Thank you. <laughs>